lot of people dismiss the whole idea that UFOs are aliens on the assumption that, or the conclusion that, it's just so crazy unlikely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a priori, there's just no point in looking at the evidence. It's just crazy unlikely. And so that was the question I tried to address. How crazy unlikely is it? Is it crazy unlikely or just a bit unlikely? And if, if, and what's the most likely story that could explain if it were true that UFOs are aliens? Today's guest is Dr. Robin Hansen, a renowned economics professor at George Mason University. Known for his pioneering work on prediction markets and the great filter hypothesis, which explores the mystery of why we haven't encountered advanced alien civilizations. His background in AI, Bayesian statistics, and hypertext publishing adds depth to the investigations into the unknown. Now join us for an intriguing discussion blending academic rigor and extraterrestrial mysteries. This was an amazing episode to shoot. Thank you again, Dr. Hansen, for joining me for this conversation. This is, of course, the Caffeinated Encrypted Podcast, and I'm your host, Bobby Dizzle. I invite everyone to subscribe to the podcast, be it via audio or visual, and of course, follow me on social media. All ways to watch, listen, and follow are, of course, in the description and at bobbydizzle.com. Subject, and since you are a professor, I wanted to clarify that this was valid since it's from Wikipedia. But do you really plan to have your brain cryogenically frozen upon your death, or is that? Uh, that's what this is for. Okay, <laughs> this is my uh, medic alert tag that uh, arranges for that. Okay, I saw that. I'm like, that's on Wikipedia, so I'm going to run that by him first. I don't know. <laughs> I don't yep. know. So that could just be a throwaway line. But are you going to do it for like to become revived it in a couple hundred years, be like a bicentennial man, or is it just to have? Yeah, the idea is to come back if you can. I mean, yeah, you know, the odds That's are badass. against it, but still, give it a try. <laughs> That's badass. Hey, any of you can try. It's not that hard. <laughs> I know. Now, now I kind of want to do it. Now, my, I was like, or is it to be like a scientific specimen for? future scientists or something, but yeah, it's to come back is much cooler. Well, I, you said I have this book, The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life mm -hmm. when Robots Rule the Earth, and it describes a world that may or may not exist, but if it mm -hmm. does, well, you know, I'll be the guy who wrote the book about their world, so they'll want to be a god to them. Yeah, come on. You'd be a god to them. Did you know well, uh, there's like a conspiracy theory that, uh, very loose conspiracy theory, that Disney made the movie Frozen, so people quit Googling Walt Disney Frozen. <laughs> I didn't know that. But and so I, when they, it, it, this conspiracy theory goes like they made Frozen. So if you Google Disney Frozen, it would quit showing results for Walt Frozen. <laughs> well, if they had, you one. know, I could see if they had five different possible titles for the movie, then this could be a factor that would weigh them on one of mm -hmm. them. Sure. I don't know what else they would call it. It's literally about Frozen, but <laughs> sounds good. Could be ice. But in the, in the age of M, uh, in the cinematic universe, the age of M, for lack of a better term, I know it's nonfiction. Um, in the scenario of the book, is there also an AI growing like we would know it? Or is the M, are they kind of like a steampunk version of AI? Like, will AI be developed in that world? Well, there are two at least different ways you could achieve mm. human level intelligence. Mm -hmm. And the age of M is describing one of them as reaching human level before the other. So the other one's still there. It's just not as advanced at that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, before then, presumably we'll have lots of AI like we have now, and it will slowly mm -hmm. be taking over jobs and tasks and doing more things. But the assumption of the book is when we finally can do brain emulations, there'll still be lots of things humans are doing. So there'll still be lots of things the M's could do. And then after that, they would AI would still continue to take over tasks from the M's, but um, there'd be a world of M's because there was a world of humans just before them. I'm just I'm just picturing the little the little bitty fast M's just going yeah. nuts in their little in their little cities. And yeah. That that needs to be a Netflix series. Like I know it's I know it's meant to be a you know scientific and sure. a good future right. hypothesis, but I it's, it's it's almost funny to think about. Right. Well, I mean, I think I've said that the book is like science fiction, except mm -hmm. there's no plot and there's no characters and it all makes sense. Yep. It's and it's, I mean, it's I, that last I, part that's the hard part. But mm -hmm. I mean yeah, it, it all makes sense. Point, it would be it would be a fine place to set a story, uh, but I, you know, I've talked to science fiction authors, and honestly, they're not that interested in just having a foreign alien environment that's realistic. They choose their settings for the morality tale mm -hmm. that they want to tell, and so the structure of the world is tied into the kind of you know heroes and adventure, etc., that they're trying to set up. So if you just give them a real world, 
that's a little hard for them to work with because now they have to invent all the other <laughs> stuff without being able to mess with the world. So yeah, now it's no fun. They're just living a life from day to day. They're just EMs working. Well, yeah, as you know, in our world, we have this real complicated world and the telling mm -hmm. story is hard because you have to make your story fit with this real world you're in. Yeah, there have to be a, has to be a problem or nobody's like, well, this is boring. Right. <laughs> this is, I, I kept getting wrapped around the axle when I was going through it. I'm not all the way through it yet because I started it before we went to the beach and then the beach happened and I forgot I was reading a book and then came back as oh, I got to rip that. I got to rip that bandaid off. But I kept thinking it was a virtual world that the M's lived in. And they were kind of doing like a West world, but the real things, they're real robots. Well, they, they can be both is the key mm -hmm. point. So yeah. for desk jobs, you know, sitting in an office, they might as well be in a virtual reality office. There's not much mm -hmm. point in making a real desk and a real door, et cetera. But if they're dealing with real stuff like, a, you know, driving or managing a factory or, you know, drilling oil or something, well, for that, they need to be dealing with the real physical world. So they'd have a real body to match the world they're dealing with. So it depends on how far from the world their experience is. That is, if they're you know, just like most of us sitting in an office, mm -hmm. it's a virtual, you know, like our me. office is basically a virtual reality. <laughs> that is, it's, not, it's we, we make the surfaces and everything else the way we want them, according mm -hmm. to indulge us. Uh, they aren't very tied to some outside reality. So for M's, when they're in an office, it might as well be whatever they want it to be. Mm hmm and, and like we, we drive to an office to get on the internet and when we can stay home and be on the internet, but we just, we drive 20 minutes to get there. If you were though, do it as you used to. Yeah. I was like, why don't we keep driving in here to get on the same internet we had at the house? This is stupid. Right. Of course you're trying to interact <laughs> with your colleagues and it does usually yeah. help to uh, have some personal mm -hmm. interaction with your colleagues. But like I said uh, earlier, before we got started, th uh, this podcast is sort of has a roots planted in the, uh, in high strangeness and subsequently paranormal. Um, and it's been said uh, you know, technology so advanced is indistinguishable from magic. Um, do you have you given any thought to like the phenomenon, maybe that we experience? Like some of the, I don't know how deep you go into it with some of the cryptid hunters and the UFO hunters and some of the spirit see the orbs. Could that be some kind of technology that so far advanced that we think it's just some kind of weird happening in nature, but it's actually just their way of traveling from a may or may not be another dimension. Well, I, I guess it depends on just how much of your world you think is full of strange, very advanced things. Like if if most all of it was, then it's kind of weird that it all looks so dead. It's like, look, a lot of the universe around us looks pretty dead, right? Mm -hmm. nice even, the, even the moon, moon, moon looks pretty, pretty dead. And you go down, you know, a little bit under the ground and then it just looks like plain rock. So our universe looks like it's a lot of dead and there's this little layer of life on our planet, which is unusual. We don't see much of it anywhere. If, if that was all an illusion, if almost all of it was wild and alive, then it's the question, well, why are they pretending to be dead? I mean, I would think just a weird mm -hmm. wild world of life would not look dead. That, that would be my presumption. So the mm -hmm. fact that a lot of it looks dead makes me kind of think, well, okay, a lot of it probably is dead. <laughs> then there might be exceptions. There might be some few rare exceptions, but I'm still going to think most stuff that looks dead is dead. And there might be a few things that happen to look dead that aren't dead. And, and you know, so that's, that's the key question. And that mm -hmm. I, ha I have given some, that some thought in the context of UFOs. Yeah. Not yeah. because I'm especially interested in, or find these plausible, but because I felt I had done some work that made me an expert on that. And I felt it was my obligation to, you know, think it through. So I did this work on what I call grabby aliens a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. And that's about where are aliens in space time. And I have a three parameter model, each parameter fit to data, giving a distribution of aliens in space time. And I'm pretty proud of that. And it seems like it answers this really important question. And so given that I'm now an expert on where are aliens in space time and what they're doing, mm -hmm. of course, this model of aliens in space time has to be fit to a story of what they're doing why why they're where they are and what's what's going on then if somebody says oh well, these weird things people see like ufos those are aliens i go well you know some people dismiss that on the basis of saying look i don't care what you see this is just so crazy unlikely that there's just no point in considering it and that's an argument based on a prior so in any mm -hmm. sort of analysis of data and trying to explain it we, we talk about a Bayesian approach and the idea is we split the analysis into what's called a prior and a post 
and, and a likelihood. So the likelihood is saying, okay, if this theory was true, what sort of things would we see? How similar to what we see are the things we would see if this theory were true? So that's what a likelihood is. And the prior is, okay, but how plausible is it, you know, ignoring the evidence that this would be the sort of thing that would be true? And because there's this mm -hmm. hypothesis that say UFOs are aliens, that hypothesis in a Bayesian analysis, there's two parts. There would be, okay, if they were aliens, what would they look like? Wouldn't that look much like what we see? Mm -hmm. Or if they were something else, what would that look like? That's the likelihood. But the other part is the, okay, but how a prior plausible at all is it that there would be aliens around? And because I did this analysis of aliens, I felt, look, I'm an expert on the prior. I should speak up to that. So again, a lot of people dismiss the whole idea that UFOs are aliens on the assumption that, or the conclusion that, it's just so crazy unlikely mm -hmm. a priori. There's just no point in looking at the evidence. It's just crazy unlikely. And so that was the question I tried to address. How crazy unlikely is it? Is it crazy unlikely or just a bit unlikely? And if, if, and what's the most likely story that could explain if it were true that UFOs are aliens? That's what I'm an expert on from my analysis of aliens. So I, I like to make the analogy to a murder trial. Mm -hmm. um, when somebody's accused of murder, we listen and we say, okay, what evidence do you have? And again, that's a combination of evidence, you know, smoking gun, whatever else it is, plus the prior. Well, how believable is it that, you know, this person would have, would have actually murdered somebody? And in a murder trial, the prior of any one accusation is roughly one in a million. That is roughly one in a thousand people get murdered. And each person had roughly a thousand people nearby who might have done it. And so any one accusation of this guy killed that guy is roughly mm -hmm. a one in a million you know, prior. But evidence can overcome that. That is, ordinary evidence of the sort we see in murder trials is quite capable of getting you to overcome this one in a million reluctance to believe it by showing mm -hmm. you specific evidence. And so now if it was a one in a quadrillion or something, well, we probably wouldn't. We would just say, no, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, I don't care what you think you saw. Yeah. You probably just made a mistake. You were delusional something because that's just so crazy and likely it, you know, there's no way you could get me enough evidence to overcome my prior that that's just crazy. So. In with UFOs, my analysis, or my conclusion is we're talking roughly a one in 10,000 prior. That is, if I didn't know anything about UFO evidence and I was just supposed to look yeah. at my analysis and say, what's the chances there would be UFOs hanging around now doing roughly the sort of things that UFOs are doing, I would give it a one in 10,000 chance. And so like, that's definitely not saying I'm sure that it's true, mm -hmm. yeah. but, it, but it's high enough to say, well, if you think you got evidence here, we, we got to look at it. We, we can't just dismiss this on the basis of saying mm -hmm. that's crazy. That's my main conclusion is it's not crazy. It might be false, but it's not crazy. Mm -hmm. You got to look at the evidence. I think that's what a lot of the uh, 2021 uh, disclosure but the Congress was about like, it's too much going on for it not to be something. We got to talk about it a little bit. Well, they wanted to seem serious and I guess that mm -hmm. is appropriate for politicians. They need to seem serious. So yeah. Um, but of course they were ambiguous about what conclusions mm -hmm. they were drawing and trying to set on the edge of, you know, seriously considering it, maybe, maybe not going overboard. They got they, poor David Grush up there talking about biologics. Yeah, well, obviously, some people said some things that <laughs> you're not sure you can believe because you want to know. Okay, what's the evidence for this? And then we weren't really mm -hmm. showed we weren't really shown much evidence there. But the mere fact that these people were taken seriously is some evidence. But you know, honestly, this is what politicians do. Mm -hmm. You know, and it came out of nowhere. Well, there was stuff going on behind the scenes, but yeah, yeah. yeah. To, to us, like we're just like, okay, we're, we're in the middle. I'm not going to say pandemic again, but all of a sudden, just and also aliens. What, what? Because I was happy. I'm like, right. yes, what? Okay, we'll do that. Right. <laughs> well, so, you know, I've looked at some of the evidence. I've read a couple of books on the subject mm -hmm. and et cetera. So there definitely seems to be some 
instant, you know, episodes, say the Nimitz aircraft carrier in 2004, where basically you go, wow, that's kind of weird. I was going to ask you about that. You talk about the okay. tic-tac. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure each way, but I say like, you can't just easily dismiss this. Okay. Yeah. Somebody's got to look at these details. Like I'm not the expert to look at these details. So I know this isn't my job, but I can tell, look, this isn't, a, you can't just wave your hand and say that's a balloon or, you know, sunlight yeah. reflecting off the water or some crap like that. I mean, come on. It's definitely more than that. What it is, I don't know. But again, mm -hmm. I presented myself as saying there's two different things you can specialize in here. And I can specialize in the part that I'm good at. And I can speak to that. And the other part, other people are going to have to talk about. And, you know, the, obviously, if you're talking about Air Force, I'm sorry, Navy pilots and what they're seeing, mm -hmm. then those are the kind of people who would have the evidence and, and know specifics of you know what kind of things you might see when and how they'd look mm -hmm. and et cetera and they should be speaking to that part of the analysis i can speak to the prior and you can't just do the typical oh he's a crazy whack job when you're talking about david fravor because he's like he's not he's no nope. as legit as they come as far as okay, right as far as it doesn't mean go. he's right i mean yeah in principle he could still be wrong but you can't just wave your hand and say that's crazy you, yeah, no, he's crazy. Engage it. the scary thing to me is what if they're Russian or China, Chinese, and it's some kind of hidden technology. But well, right, but the, the, strange, the strange thing there, look, the technologies that would be real if these technologies are what they seem mm -hmm. aren't just a little bit more advanced than what we have. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> it's, a lot. it's way more. And you think, look, <clears throat> if, if you were paying billions of dollars for militaries in order to defend yourself or even be, you know, support aggression. <laughs> you got a budget and you're trying to like spend it the best you can. If they had access to this sort of technology, I look at the way they spend all the other money we can see. And I go, why would you be spending your money that way? Look, you have this super spectacular mm -hmm. tech. It's just weird. It's like, you know, if you can make tanks and you're spending money on horses, I'm going like, why, why spend money on horses for battle? If you, if you can make tanks, then yeah, of course you'd be making tanks. So the puzzle is, if this is Chinese or Russian, what are they doing with all the other crap they spend money on? I mean, we can see in you know Ukraine Russia war, we see what the Russians are spending money on, and you know they're they're having they're struggling with it. And we can see it looks like they're trying as hard as they can. And mm -hmm. look, if they had technology like the Tic Tac, why, why wouldn't they be using it? Why why, yeah. why would they be spending money on all this other stuff that's so much less effective? I never thought of that that uh, particular concept before. That's kind of like building bow and arrows when you get submachine guns. Like, why do you have a bow and arrow department? <laughs> right. So that, that's the problem, of course. I mean, you know, obviously, another problem is like, look, there's a lot of leakage. Uh, you know, the wor world, you know, no one part of the world is that much more advanced than the rest because we all have, you know, ability to look over the fence and see what people are mm -hmm. doing and, you know, sneak, o sneak over there and, you know, <laughs> hire people from there to come over here. And that's why, you know, technology leaks all over the world because, you know, we are all looking to keep up with everybody, right? Mm -hmm. That's a Chinese so, space shuttle. It's just like ours. Right, exactly. So <laughs> exactly. You know, so that limits sort of how plausible it is that they could be vastly more advanced on any particular tech than we are, right, uh, among the people that we know on the Earth. Mm -hmm. So somehow you'll have to explain these weird things in terms of some tech that's clever but not that much better than what we've got. But that's a that's a kind of a hard story to tell about stuff. It looks on the surface like, no, this is crazy better. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's like thousands of years more. So, so that's that's the hard part of explaining this in terms of other familiar Earth organizations is just how are you going to tell the story that this is just a bit better than what we got? <laughs> just the, the only explanation I can come up with, because I do kind of hang out in maybe the circles where they would maybe talk about this a little bit more serious than... But like, what, maybe it's like a laser guided drone. That's just, but that's still, it's a solid object doing right. that. I mean, it's hard a, to think a better about. story is that people have figured out how to send particle beams or lasers at that intersect and then make a glowing thing that's just a plasma that they can move mm -hmm. around because they just turn the direction of these lasers. Mm -hmm. And so they can make them suddenly jump or speed along because there isn't really a thing there. <laughs> There's just a glowing pile of gas that they made by... Yeah projecting beams on it that that's a possibility but the question yeah, that's is about it you know how how much could that make sense but 
I mean, we should go back to basics. Look, when we're trying to explain this stuff, we have a limited range of theories we can work with, right? Mm -hmm. One set of theories is just mistakes and delusions, right? It was a balloon. It was a reflection. It was the moon. It was Venus. It was, you <laughs> know. Swamp gas. Right. It's exactly. Swamp gas. Exactly. Piss off Jimmy Carter. So that's one class of solutions. And I got to say, you know, that, that works for a lot of cases out there, but there's a, certainly mm -hmm. a set of cases where that's just a really hard stretch. Uh, did you, did you watch the book? Uh, I've, I've certainly seen some things from it, um, but the point is there are these harder cases and mistakes yeah. and delusions is a hard sell, but you know, it still could be true in some sense that maybe there's a way we're not mm -hmm. really thinking about the sort of mistake or delusion you could make. And once we understand that, we'll go, oh, I guess, you know, this makes sense, but still yeah <laughs> right okay. so far with it too okay another class of theories is as you were just mentioning some mm -hmm. hidden organizations on earth of other humans that are keeping secrets and are you know hiding tech oh, that yeah. they've got that the rest of us you know don't know about and then again the question is well why aren't they using it for all the other expensive stuff they seem to be spending on but okay that's another that's a second class of solutions a third class of solutions is Okay, maybe they're really aliens, right? And you know, that's what I was talking about having the prior for. Okay, we can go into that more if you want. You know, what sure. what would make sense there? But there's a fourth class of solutions we should notice and keep in mind, and that's hoaxes and lies. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll forget that. Yeah, right. you know, so if you if you look at say the U.S. government over the decades, they have sometimes lied. <laughs> they have sometimes fake things, especially saying you know we know that in World War II. They made whole fake fleets, fake mm -hmm. invasions, and all sorts of things to try to trick the other side into thinking a bunch of stuff was happening that wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. You know, inflatable and, tanks. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, we've even had you know secret CIA or whatever projects that didn't come to light till several decades afterwards. They kept the secrets for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. So, and on the prior, so we got to say the prior on that's pretty damn high. <laughs> That is, yeah, yeah they, that's, they, 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 they do, this happens, right? It's almost a thing. Is what, right, okay. It's like your shtick. <laughs> so, and if you look at the evidence, you go, okay, well, how could, you know, hoaxes and lies explain this? You know, look at this cool stuff that David Fraber says he saw, and we go, says he saw. <laughs> hoaxes and lies, says he saw. Well, I mean, how are we sure that he's not lying, right? That's... That's where you got to go when you're thinking of hoaxes, lies. You're trying to think of all these people you would usually trust and asking, yeah, but what if it was a lie? <laughs> and so I do think mm -hmm. you, you got to go there mentally and try to think about all of these famous events and go, well, what, let's say, you know, look at the custody of evidence here. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. who was holding this evidence when and who could have messed with it when? Who, who are you believing exactly? So I don't mean to imply this, that's a case shut it, we're done and, and explains it. I just mm, mean, yeah. look, you, you gotta be looking at this family of explanations. It's gotta be a factor. And I think what helps him out is the gimbal footage that came out a couple of years later that actually had pictures of what he saw, even though it was in the IR spectrum. Sure, but you know, people can fake with pictures too. Oh, you telling me? <laughs> fake pictures, what? <laughs> Yeah, so that's why you gotta like be careful. But honest, so honestly, like the most disturbing thing I think is like if I believe that the say the U.S. federal government faked a lot of UFO reports, a lot of them, not just a few, because like we actually know they actually faked a few because that you know there were these prototypes of you know spy planes they were working on, and they basically lied to people to convince them those were UFOs in order to you know hide the fact that they had these spy planes and didn't want people to see about them. So we know. The federal government has actually lied oh, yeah. about UFOs before. But if there was a program to lie about a lot more, that is, you know, most of the most famous reports were some sort of a lie, if they'd be willing to do that and they did that, well, hats off to them. It's a pretty, pretty well executed arrangement, mm -hmm. I got to say, you know, good job, guys. But I also got to say, OK, the moon landing, you know, some people say that was faked. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go. Well, if you fake the UFOs, maybe you fake the moon landings too, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna worry more about that, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's that's such a sore subject to me. not sore subject. It's I'm torn because I love a good conspiracy theory. I just love it. 
And but I'm also in Huntsville, Alabama, and right moon land the moon landings yeah. are mascot. It's right. <laughs> anyway, right, sure. But anyway, that's where you gotta go. Well, yeah, I love it. But I mean, the point here was just to list these other categories mm -hmm. of explanations that we really have to take seriously, right? Uh, but yeah. then the last one, perhaps the most interesting one, is the aliens one. And uh, you know, you might wonder, well, okay, my job is to say what the number is, like how 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 plausible is it that aliens would be here now doing the weird things they're doing? And then to come up with the, the best story of what that could be. What, how could that make sense? So I summarize the key things to explain as two key things. So again, the hypothesis is, okay, you have, some UFOs are aliens. And I need to come up with a story that makes sense of that in the light of some things that seem kind of not to make sense. <laughs> Here's, here's the two things that don't make sense. One is, okay, they're here right now, but if we look at nearby stars, the rest of the galaxy, the rest of the solar system, we don't see much there. Nope. So they're not doing that much there. And we're pretty sure that if there were, in fact, aliens out there that had an origin independent of ours, they would have arisen, say, tens and hundreds of millions of years before us. Mm -hmm. That is, the universe is 14 billion years old. <laughs> so the odds that they would have arisen in like in the same 10,000 years as us is really small. So mm -hmm. just, you know, in terms of just independent origins, either they're before us or we're before them. <laughs> if we're before them, of course, they're not here now. But if they were here before us, they were here, they could have been here a lot longer. <laughs> a long, long time ago, tens or hundreds of millions of years ago. That I think we're pretty sure of that. So that means in those tens or hundreds of millions of years, they could have done a lot of other things besides coming here. <laughs> they could have colonized the galaxy. It, you know, even in one million years, you could easily colonize the whole galaxy and change everything. Because a million years is a really a long time. A billion years is an even longer time. So the important thing is, look, the universe is really old compared to our civilization. You know, our civilization may be a few thousand years old, and the universe yep. is 14 billion years ago. So you have to take those time differences into account when you're thinking about aliens. You got to go, they got to be really old. And that meant they could have gone out there and just changed the universe near us completely. But by assumption, they didn't. So that's one thing to explain. Well, how is it that they did not change everything you see around us, but did come here now? It's kind of weird, right? Because mm -hmm. they just went everywhere like they came here, then we, we would just see a lot more stuff. Okay, that's puzzle number one. Why are they here now, but not anywhere else we can see? Puzzle number two is when they're here, because they're, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of years more advanced than us, we know they could have done one of two things that would be the obvious things to do. One, they could have made themselves completely obvious. Obviously, they know where we're concentrated. If they wanted to be visible, they could definitely do it. They could show up in Times Square, in front of the White House, whatever. They could just be really obvious. <laughs> There's no question that if they had one and two, they could be really obvious, right? The other thing is, say they just wanted to watch us and not, not be noticed. They could do that easy. They could just have you know, a black sphere orbiting the planet with you know, fantastically powerful telescopes. We'd never see it. They could make it so damn black, so damn silent, we would just mm -hmm. never notice it, right? <laughs> That's also within their capabilities. So they could either be completely obvious or completely invisible. Those are, I think, pretty obvious conclusions from the fact that they're way, way more advanced than us. My scenario that makes sense of this starts with panspermia. Life didn't start on Earth. It came somewhere from somewhere else. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the idea of panspermia. And plausibly, um, it started right at the beginning of our solar system and our planet's history when our star was in a stellar nursery of plausibly thousands of other stars, all in a big, what's called a molecular cloud. And all these stars were started at the same time because the cloud collapsed and all these stars formed mm -hmm. and then all the planets formed. And all of these stars were very close to each other. The planets were close to each other. There were lots of rocks going back and forth. 
So if life from elsewhere had seeded that nursery, it would have seeded not just our star, but most of the other stars too. Because again, they were all really close, rocks flying back and forth all mm -hmm. the time. So panspermia, if it had seeded life on Earth, because life does seem to have started on Earth very early, so plausibly it started right from the beginning, then it would have seeded not just our star, but the other stars in our nursery, roughly a thousand or 10, even 10,000 stars. After those, that formation with a few million years, those stars drifted apart from each other and eventually spread out into a ring around the galaxy at our mm -hmm. radius from the center. And right now there are a thousand or so other stars out there that are our stellar siblings. And we can actually see them with telescopes by seeing they have the same spectra as our sun in terms of the mixes of elements because they were coming from the same cloud. So there are siblings for our star out there right now in the galaxy. And if life had been seeded on our star, around our star, at the very beginning, it would have plausibly seeded those other stars too. So they would also be siblings on the path of life. Cool. So then, plausibly, they also were evolving over the last billions, four billion years. And they went through different stages. Mm -hmm. And then finally, one of them at least got to our level now before us. They're panspermia siblings. So that would be a story about, so this explains one key thing. You know, basically our grabby aliens analysis of aliens says that advanced aliens like us appear roughly once per million galaxies. Really rare. Really? So the key up, then the key question mm -hmm. is, well, how is it there could be any aliens near us? <laughs> if on average they show up once per million galaxies, it's really unlikely that they would be even in the same galaxy as us, much less close to us. So gra gra panspermia siblings explains why the rest of the universe that we can see could be really empty, but there are aliens right near us. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there are siblings. <laughs> they came from the same origin. So... That explains part of why most of the universe mm -hmm. around us looks empty, even though they and we are here. But that's not quite enough because, again, if they showed up in the last 10 million years or 100 million years, they could have easily filled up our galaxy, if not a lot more. So we have to postulate that for some reason they chose not to. They may be environmentalism, maybe religion. Maybe the fact that they didn't want to have their cultures fragment across many different star systems. Mm -hmm. For some reason, they did not want to expand out from their home system very far. And they had a rule against it. See, the only way that they could prevent expansion would be to make sure no part of them expanded, right? If they're a big solar system with lots of mm -hmm. parts, if any one part left and went off to try to make a colony, then well, that's the end of it. You know, whole thing's expanding. So in order to have a system that doesn't expand, they kind of have to make a rule and enforce it that says nobody gets to leave. But maybe they did that. So that's another assumption <laughs> here is first we assume panspermia siblings, then we assume the siblings that are showed up before us, they made a rule for some reason, no expansion. Now, from their point of view, they know they have siblings. And they know that any one of these siblings could break the rule. If any of their siblings mm -hmm. got to their level and started to expand, well, this whole no expansion thing's over, right? So that would give them a reason to come here, to make an exception to their own expansion, right? So basically, if they just allow everybody to leave and go off and do stuff, that's going to be really hard to prevent them from colonizing and spreading. So they're basically not going to let anybody leave from home very often. So exceptions got to be rare. But... <laughs> If they're here now, they made an exception for us. Like, okay, that trip's allowed. Usually nobody's allowed to leave, but this one, okay, we'll say this trip is allowed. Why would they make an exception for us? Well, we're at risk of breaking the rule. If we continue to develop in a natural way, we may well not adopt the rule they adopted. We may well decide to expand. And if we do, their rule is done. Expansion happens, right? And pretty fast. In a million years, we could colonize the galaxy, right? Oh, yeah. And say, you know, they may have been around for 100 million years. So they've known for a long time this was a risk. They've been watching their siblings because that's easy to do from home. 
and they could see which of them looked like they might be at risk of developing advanced life. And they could make sure they send exceptional, you know, probes, uh, pro expeditions out to those few places that are at risk of breaking the rule. And then that's a reason why they're here right now, but not everywhere else we can see. So I've made some, ex in order to explain these weird facts, I've made some assumptions. One, pain's very mm -hmm. Second, they have the rule against expansion. But that are that by itself predicts that they would be here now. And why would they be here? What do you say? What, what, why? Stop, stop us from uh, expanding. Exactly, right. So now- I was, li I was listening, I didn't know there was an, I didn't know there was an okay. question and answer session. Exactly. Like, <laughs> well, you know, I'm a professor, I gotta ask. <laughs> I know, I'm okay, I'm listening, I'm listening so intently. Okay, so <laughs> now we also know that they had an easy solution. They could have just destroyed us. Oh yeah. They didn't even have to you know, come here. They could have just sent a missile bomb, whatever, destroy us. That would have solved their problem, right? So we also can see they didn't do that. So another assumption we have to add into the MISC is they have they feel a little affiliation with us, a little mm -hmm. compassion, a little connection. They don't want to just kill us. They might be willing to do so pushed to, if they yeah. push them at it. So we should be careful about pushing them too far. But their first choice is not to just kill us, right? Mm -hmm. okay, so now, <laughs> okay, so now we've got... They made an exception from the usual thing. They sent an expedition here for the purpose of you know, getting us not to expand. They decided they don't want to just kill us, so they want to instead convince us not to expand. Okay? That would be the, the clean, peaceful thing to do. And whatever this expedition was, they have to worry about it breaking the rules too, right? The reason why they didn't want to let many people leave from home is that any one expedition that left from home, it could start a whole bunch more expeditions and break the whole thing, right? Everybody, anyone leaving from home is the big risk of the whole thing breaking down. Mm -hmm. So whatever they sent here had to be sent with a pretty simple strategy. Given the you know, equipment and authorization to implement that strategy, but it's not given a full authorization to invent its own solutions. <laughs> They're not going to give it that much freedom and discretion, okay? Because that would risk the whole thing mm -hmm. going wrong, right? So they they lock down this thing, maybe send along political officers to make sure that they, you know, obey the home's command. But they send them here with some strategy to convince us not to expand. So now the question is, what could that strategy be? What could their strategy be to convince us not to expand? It needs to be a simple thing, easy to execute with whoever they send here. And then they have a plan A that they're hoping will go with, a plan A somehow to convince us not to expand, because for some reason, that's what they want. They don't want expansion. OK, so now ask, well, how could they convince us? OK, so now I have the next key assumption is that they are also a social species like we do. We are most social species on Earth, at least among mammals, have status hierarchies. That is, some animals are higher status than others. And this is, in fact, how humans domesticate other animals and ourselves. How do we domesticate horses and, and dogs, etc.? Well, we just slot in at the top of their status hierarchy. We say, we're the top horse, we're the top dog, and, you know, mm -hmm. you should do what we say. And so a, stra a standard strategy we use to get other animals to do what we want is to find their status hierarchy and slot in at the top of their status hierarchy. And how do you do that? You just be stronger, more impressive, more whatever it is that counts for status among those animals, and then you get to be at the top. And that's what humans do to each other. When we domesticate each other, you know, when humans mm -hmm. went and conquered some new area, what did they do to get the locals to accept the new lords? Well, they built a palace, and they had fine, fine uh, finery of clothing, and they mm -hmm. had impressive horses and you know soldiers, whatever you... You impress them that you're the top dog. You're at the top of the hierarchy, and then they'll they'll accept it. Okay, so this looks pretty universal across social species on Earth. So the assumption is, well, what if it's universal across the universe? They also came from a social species. They also had a status hierarchy. Mm -hmm. They also domesticated other animals by slipping at the top of their status hierarchy, right? So that would suggest the obvious solution. 
How do they get us to do what they want? Well, they domesticate us. <laughs> how do they do that? Well, they come in and they slot into the top of our status hierarchy. Okay, but how do they do that? Well, we're impressed by stuff. <laughs> so they have to come and do the stuff we're impressed by, except better than us, and then not be too hostile and too you know mean mm -hmm. uh, in order to convince us that, hey, they're the top dogs and we should do what they want. And that's the scenario. So to do that, first of all, they can't be completely invisible. That won't work. We're not going to be impressed if they're not completely mm -hmm. invisible. Okay, yeah. right? So on the other hand, they could have been completely visible. So why didn't they do that? We say, well, look, we're going to accept them as the top dog unless we're really repulsed by them. <laughs> you know, if, if, they're, if they're like spiders and we just hate spiders, yeah. it might just be hard to, to accept them and do what they want because, ew, spiders, right? So, look, they knew that they didn't know that much about exactly what we were like because they you know, had to make these strategies from a long way off. And so they need to find a way to impress us, but they probably, they're, they're pretty confident, and that's probably true, that if they revealed everything about themselves, we would find something about them we hate. Maybe they eat babies, who knows? Maybe they eat snot. <laughs> I don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. But if they just showed up on the White House lawn and you know, allowed us to go into their ship and you know, told us everything about their history and their habits, we'd find something we hate. Because we're just, look, look how we find we hate other people on Earth, right? And we'll say it works in the same in cultures. You find other cultures exactly. that have something, so... Right. So we're not actually that very forgiving to other cultures on Earth, right? Mm -hmm. We find one little thing and we're willing to hate them for it, right? And so they figured that's probably going to happen to them if they showed lots of details about themselves. So they decide, okay, they can't show lots of details and they can't be completely invisible. So the answer is to hang out at the edge. Just show us what they need to, to impress us, to domesticate us, but don't show too much else. Of course, we would have to know what their agenda is, what they want from us. And so the question is, well, why aren't they just telling us that? Why don't they just tell us, hey, we're here and we don't want you to expand? Well, the story would be they thought through and they said, you guys are smart, you'll figure it out. Because <laughs> they, you know, they know that we can walk through the analysis I've just walked you through. Mm -hmm. They don't have to tell us. We can figure out, oh, why are you here? I guess looks like you didn't expand. You're here as an exception. I guess you don't want us to expand. And often, in fact, people who have said they've encountered UFOs and said, I'm getting a feeling from this is what they want, they've said this. They've said they don't want us to expand. They don't want us to mess with mm -hmm. nature, blah, blah, blah. That's a thing people have said. I don't know if that's because aliens were doing something special or just, you know, this is what people made up. But the point is, it, it's not a crazy thing to think. No. It comes to mind as a thing, as a reason they could be here, as an agenda they could have. And when now when you do the analysis, you go, yeah, well, that would make sense. So now, okay. So now to explain the two key facts, they're here, but not all the other places we could see, even though they're much older than us, and they're hanging out at the edge, but not invisible, not really visible. To explain those, we postulate they're panspermia siblings. They have a rule against expansion. And they've guessed correctly that we have status hierarchies. We can be domesticated by slotting at the top of our status hierarchy. So that's what they're mm -hmm. going to do. They're going to come here and be impressive, not do anything useful, but just show us that they are just more impressive than us. And then that's the story. So when I estimate sort of what's the chance of each of these things, that's where I get the 10,000. Saying, okay, you know, panspermia, siblings could be one in a 10, one in a 100. Them having a rule against expansion, like maybe one in ten. Them guessing that we have mm -hmm. that is hard keys, you know, maybe even one in two. Okay, we're there. You know, we, we've got a one in a thousand, one in ten thousand prior story about why they're here, mm -hmm. what they're doing. And again, that doesn't mean it's true. That's no, the prior. Right. And then you have to look at the evidence, like in the Nimitz or whatever, and say, okay, but what's our best theory of what this actual evidence is? And is it best explained by this theory? It's kind of it's supported pretty well with the um, the fact that they they started increasing their uh, sightings after the uh, nukes went off back in the forties. Kind of like, oh gosh, these monkeys are these monkeys are getting close. Maybe then they figure now it's time yeah. that we might listen. We better do I don't something. Know. <laughs> right, so, I mean, you know, one of the points is okay. By this theory, they could have been around for you know hundreds of thousands of mm -hmm. years. 
It's kind of and, dormant. And so, well, they might have been doing impressive things, but <laughs> not that we would notice. So in some way, you know, we can't really be impressed unless we sort of get that they're actually there and that they're actually doing something, right? If it's just some weird flashy thing in nature that, you know, nature is full of weird things, you really can't be that impressed. You're only going to be impressed and treat them as a, you know, high status member of your, uh, you know, your, your group if you see mm -hmm. them as actually agents who are purposely doing something and, you know, actually have these capacities and then, you know, that's a... It'll take some while for us to even mm -hmm. see them that way. They're just they're just punching air, thinking, "Is the pyramid not good enough for you? <laughs> it means nothing." Yeah, and for all we know, what they did is something we haven't even found yet. Like it could be like it could have done other more impressive things, sure. Yeah. But, you know, than just hang out at the edge of our visibility. But that's at least the thing we're kind of noticing now. Yeah, there's a, right. there's a creepy pasta that's funny about the Amora Mora, Amua Mora, the. Uh, the rock that came through interstellarly a few years ago. Oh, right, yeah. There's a creepy pasta that was an alien probe, and they were scouting this. But right, I mean, but <laughs> probably a rock. You know, the point would be to be more. <laughs> we we can't really tell. Okay, was that an alien probe? Was it just a rock? Yeah, it's a rock. <laughs> so you know, the point of this story is they got to do stuff that's kind of yeah. makes it clear it off. At least averaging over cases. Oh, there's really someone there, and they're really doing something. And put their brand on it. Yeah, they're just uh just so we know. And it does look like UFOs are more like that. There's lots of sightings. They do pretty similar things. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty peaceful. They don't threaten us, mostly, unless we attack them. And, uh, they're, but they're definitely there, and they're definitely really capable. And at least if the usual stories can be believed, you know, they're there, they're capable, and they're just showing off, basically. Look what we can do. And I mean, would you, it was really would true. You, they really are impressive. I mean, honestly, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, go say, yep. You win. Yes, if if they if they're there doing it, it's definitely ball game for us. If it's we can't stop it, we're going to nuke them. We're going to shoot them with a gun. It's not going to right. Well, of course, <laughs> bounce off. You know, this is what often happens when you try to domesticate an animal, like a dog or a horse or something else. Well, first they're going to try to fight you to see if they you deserve. You a little bit. Yeah, they, they're going to say, "Well, you say you're the top dog, but you know, you need to prove it to me." But they're going to like take you on and try to fight you a bit, and then the top dog has to. Put them down gently but firmly and say, mm -hmm. I really am the top dog. I really am stronger than you. And I'm just, you know, you made me show it. Fine, I'm going to show it. I mean, you know, kids do this to their parents all the time, right? Kids are constantly mm -hmm. challenging their parents' authority and strength and forcing the parents mm -hmm. to prove that they, yeah, really are the parents and they really can make you go to bed. Yes, they, yes, they are. <laughs> they're, they're doing it right now outside my door. That's why I have to keep muting. Yeah. Because... Ed, so would you consider this, um, you know, kind of like you described the galactic law, don't expand this hypothetical? Well, this it's hypothetical only a law galactic. of this one yeah. culture, but if they make sure nobody else is around, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's the law for whoever they can impose it on. I mean, that would be part of the uh, kind of like a, a factor in the great filter that you're so so well known for. Well, right? it, would, it would definitely help explain why everything is so yeah. empty around here. Yeah, so... We should just maybe review the grabby aliens model. The grabby aliens model, mm -hmm. as I said, has three parameters, each fit to data. And the simple story is a you know, advanced civilizations appear at random places in space, you know, near stars, say, mm -hmm. and they appear at a random point in time, which is a power law of time because they have to go through a sequence of hard steps like we did on Earth. So life on Earth had to go through some hard steps, and we had a deadline before life on Earth was impossible, before we get to our stage, and then that has to help them elsewhere. And then once we reach the level we're at, then the next thing that happens to the models, they just expand as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. and that's the end of it. They just keep expanding until they meet other ones who are expanding, and then that's the end of the model. So the simple story there of grabby aliens is once they appear and start expanding, that's just it. That's all they do. They expand. And the idea is that whatever they touch, they change in some visible way. So mm -hmm. there are these spheres in the universe expanding and if you could be from the right vantage to see them you would see them as different you know that sphere is full of aliens who've changed the volume to do whatever they want to do mm -hmm. and it looks different from stuff they haven't got to yet so that's the idea of the grabby aliens model so um yes that model predicts that they're really long way away and it'll be say a billion years till we meet them if we go out to meet them and so they're really rare and that's fine except you know ufos don't make much sense there right you just take that model by itself. You say, well, UFOs couldn't possibly be here because the nearest one is, you know, a million galaxies away. Yeah. Um, 
I've seen, I actually saw the model you're talking about, the, the 3D graphic with the circles, ex uh, spheres right, yep. expanding together. That's It has to do with the panspermia as well, like you were saying earlier. Well, like, actually, so that yeah. version of the model doesn't include any panspermia. So that just has, oh, oh. that just has independent origins. Things just appear at random independent places. They grow and then they meet. Panspermia then is a change of that model. It says, oh, no, they could appear together in a correlated way because you know, a, a star system might get seeded with many stars in the same birth, you know, place where stars are born, the same nursery. Mm -hmm. And then a bunch of places that oh, like okay. appear would all appear in a clump near each other. It's almost like a, a an alien fairy ring. Just they grow right yeah. in one spot and they expand this way. What What do you think human, the, what was the minimum humans would have to do to become a grabby alien species? Like if we started like mining the moon for H3, would that make us grabby aliens or would? No, the, the key thing would be able to send out a probe to another star mm -hmm. that could reproduce itself and then send out more probes. Yeah. That's a big one. So, another so, star is a biggie. <laughs> what, right. So if you could send out probes to other asteroids in the solar system and they could reproduce, well, you could get to the rest of the solar system. You could fill the solar system that way, but mm -hmm. pretty hard to get to the next star that way. So there, there's the really long deserts between the stars. And so you it's, really will need the ability to cross those deserts to get to the other side and then you know, reproduce there. It's such a wide space is so big like we can't i tried to fathom it just from like you know thinking about it it's it's Absolutely impossible huge right well yeah so i think you know you have to realize it takes what like eight eight minutes or eight, eight seconds minutes. for light eight minutes for light to get from the sun to here and then you're thinking about you know light years away so the difference yeah. between minutes and years is the difference between how close the sun is and how far away these things are and the sun is really far away <laughs> and alpha centauri and vega and just right. how far away that take you know, 26,000 years to get across the other side of earth takes a fraction of a second for light. Mm -hmm. So the distance to the sun is eight minutes compared to the fraction of a second to get around the earth. So the sun is way far away compared to the other side of the earth. And then these mm -hmm. stars are way far away compared to the sun. So it's a really long way, but still in the next 10,000 years, we'll probably be able to do this, you know, make a probe that goes to another star and reproduces. Yeah, that was, that was one of the, uh, and it may be in your book. I can't even remember now, but the, you know, making a computer program that you send to another star and it gathers the elements from there and creates your things from what's available at that destination. Right, right. now life on and earth, you know, little bacteria on earth, they're able to float in the atmosphere, land somewhere and, and grow mm -hmm. and reproduce. That's a thing bacteria can do. So they're, and they're really tiny, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, so it, it doesn't necessarily take a lot of stuff. It takes the right sort of stuff in the right arrangement. But now we're going to have to, instead of just floating in the atmosphere, landing on some dirt somewhere, they have to go all the way to another star. So, yeah, it's going to be a lot harder to get to another star. But um, but then once they land, they have to reproduce. They have to grow. They have to take materials and mine it and yeah. get energy and collect it and manufacture things and then make versions of themselves. But you know okay. that's what life does, so clearly it's possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically what breeding, reproducing is. Right. Yeah, uh, kind of like a three D printer. Just taking taking the elements you have available and just making what. Right, but humans haven't yet mastered that very well in the sense that yep. <laughs> we we can make a lot of stuff in the economy, and in the sense the entire world economy reproduces, but small fraction of the wor world they don't do so much reproduction because they tend to depend on the rest of the world. In terms kind of like the America, economy. Right? Kind of like America right now. And <laughs> just yeah, kind of consume. Where we can't just reproduce everything in America. America definitely relies on other parts of the world yeah. to make stuff. So so in your in your opinion, this is this is kind of a shift in gears, but other than nuclear destruction or this intergalactic law, what are other great filters that you've thought of or hypothesized? Well, um, this, outside of nuclear this, the scenario I described for the aliens is kind of one. Yeah, that's that's a big one. That is, what if we have a world government and for whatever reason it decides to prevent further growth? Uh, it might have all sorts of reasons to want to do that. Again, environmentalism, religion, the threat, for, threat of competition. It would just decide, look, this is big enough. We don't want to get any bigger. That would mess with stuff. So let's just stay this size and prevent anyone in, in our scope of control from growing bigger. That would invent, literally stop growth. Yeah. It'd be uh, a that, really great filter. That's a risk. <laughs> like, so if we, 
it's it's worse actually than big destruction. If we had like a nuclear war or something, and there's only I don't know another you know million people left on Earth and scattered around, well, they would quickly start growing again, and you know mm -hmm. within ten thousand years we'd be back where we are. But a totalitarian government that decides to stop growth, well, the question is how long can it last? Uh, you know, because it's not like any one part of the world can say, well, I just want to secede from the world and we'll just grow separately. It's going to say, no, you can't. <laughs> uh, you'll be a threat. If we let you grow very big, you're going to be a threat to us. So we're just going to, you know, nip you in the bud. I mean, that's that's North Korea. If it could. In a, in a nutshell, yeah. <laughs> if, if it could, North Korea would prevent anybody from competing with them. They would love to, they would love to secede right. from the world. So that's another great filter is the rise of a mm -hmm. long-lasting totalitarian government. Now the government does have to be competent enough. If it's really incompetent government, it'll just collapse and, and, and you know, fall in a pile of rubble and then other stuff will replace it and take over. Right. So it has mm -hmm. to be able to actually maintain control and last a long time, which is a big ask, but you know, mm -hmm. eventually we might have things like that. And you already stated it, that um, a nuclear Holocaust would still leave people to grow back eventually. Right. And even yeah. a big disease would probably would. I mean, nuclear, having, nuclear. you know, having a, even a pandemic that kills everyone is kind of a big ask because there's just a lot of people, some of whom yeah. are isolated. But would be so immune. We're, we're actually pretty hard to squash right now. Obviously, if you had like a supernova nearby or some big, huge asteroid yeah. at the Earth, well, that could do it. Although even a huge asteroid, well, as long as we have some people buried deep among below the Earth who don't come out for a few years later, they can escape the asteroid. So killing off everyone on Earth is actually quite a challenge. It'd be a tough one. What was that movie that just came out? Don't look up. Right, Meryl Streep. <laughs> that was a that was a good one. Yeah, there was they something coming at... in the sky that way. But again, they weren't thinking that much about what if you just yeah. you know dug really deep and took lots of stuff down there and waited for ten years or hundred years even. There's been a and lot of had... science fiction stories about people who dug down under the ground and just waited a long time for yep. some, something on the surface to be over. Look at Fallout just came out. That's a, the whole show. Yeah, exactly. And uh, then the Yellowstone eruption or the geothermal uh, geothermal eruption they had earlier in the week. I was right. like, oh man, is this ha is this happening? <laughs> now you you had mentioned the uh, that people underestimate the evol evolution of ocean worlds. Like, uh, right? What do you th what do you what do you think's in our oceans in, in that same vein? Like, what do you think is in our oceans that we don't see because it's like miles deep? I mean, it's not crazy that life could have evolved deep in the ocean mm -hmm. and um, become advanced, but at some point you would think they would spread out. So just like we on the surface are now spreading into the ocean, things mm -hmm. in the ocean would spread out to the surface. So uh, the question is just, that's, you know, for example, in the next thousand years, certainly 10,000 years, we will now be all over the ocean. Our descendants will definitely mm -hmm. colonize the ocean, right? They will go to the deepest parts and do whatever the hell they want down there. Within it's the free next... real estate. Right, exactly. <laughs> They're going. So if something's nearly as advanced as us, then it would also you know, colonize the land in a few thousand years if it starts in the ocean. So that suggests that in order for something under the ocean to be near our level of advancements, it's this remarkable coincidence of development where it's just at the right level we are just before we're going to go down there or they would come up mm -hmm. here. And that's kind of a unlikely coincidence. So um, now if for some reason they had this policy of being under the ocean and not and wanting to hide there, then maybe. So that's like my postulate for the aliens, right? Yeah. I'm, the postulate for the aliens that for some reason they have a policy against expansion. So we could imagine some deep sea civilization that has a policy ex against expansion onto the surface or even out from the rest of the ocean, then they might plausibly like be down there, but not come up here very fast. Right. So then they could have been mm -hmm. down there a long time, but now, you know, the question is how plausible is that? Uh, Cause if they're relatively advanced, they might like still have a lot of pollution, energy generation, mm -hmm. you know, thermal signatures, things, all sorts of other ways they might be visible. But, and of course we still might wonder what's the chances that they would have appeared down mm -hmm. there. So, you know, again, it's about like the independent origin thing it, it, for panspermia siblings. They're just on a whole separate star system. They're on this trajectory mm -hmm. that took billions of years and just happened to get us, you know, you know, before us. 
if something out of the ocean, it would have had to have a common origin with us, but just be really separate for a really long time. And then they would have mm. achieved our level, I don't know, 10 million years ago, and then decided for some reason not to, yeah. not to expand up to the surface, not to leave the bottom of the ocean. They maybe they had to make a rule against that, I guess. But then of course they might think, oh, I wonder if something on the surface will violate our rule. And then yeah, it, come up here to enforce the rule. When you would think in, a, in that particular scenario, there'd be some kind of signature of an advanced civilization somewhere. Radio waves or electromagnetic. Well, or neutrinos or something. Now, yeah, you know, something. I'm not, like I'm not going to rule it out, but I just would say, you know, it's, it's a bit unlikely, but okay, it could be true. Like, it's not crazy, but still, it's unlikely, right? And when you, when you spin a globe around and see that back part where Port Nemo, Point Nemo is and just all right. blue, like, man, what is over there? But, you know, we have gone to the bottom of the ocean in many places. So it's not, mm -hmm. you know, if they were spread across the entire bottom of the ocean, we definitely would have seen them by now. Mm -hmm. So they have to be only on a small set of, set of sections down there, right? A set of sections where we mm -hmm. just haven't looked there. And somehow we haven't seen side effects, like they're not sending bubbles of air up to the surface or, you know, the leaking chemicals that cause the chemicals, et cetera, right? There's just, so the, you know, the scenario you have to paint to make sense of this gets more and more limited the more of these details you think about, but it's still not impossible. Yeah. There's also the pressure situation. You go so far down to hide from us, you're also dealing with some logistics that you may not even be the same vein of. Uh, life form at that point just just rocks right although uh you know if they've got you know if they had an advanced civilization with limited technology but they say have 10 million years to slowly work out well i think oh, they yeah. could eventually figure stuff out i'd figure that. <laughs> yeah so this so you asked about ocean worlds so mm -hmm. basically planets like our planet are actually pretty rare compared to planets where the entire planet is covered with the deep ocean that's pretty really? common out there actually and so when people talk about, you know, basic, so in our analysis, we say we're really, really early compared to when you would expect life to appear. If, if there was just life on a random place and it would just sit there for as long as it took to appear and it was all alone and nobody else would bother mm -hmm. it, it would most likely appear near the end of the lifetime of the planet. And for most planets, that's trillions of years. So we're way early compared to when things would show up. And our explanation for that that we suggest is that, in fact, there's a deadline soon. Things like us are filling the universe, and pretty soon it's going to be full, and then you can't show up trillions of years in the future. Now, to counter this argument, some people said, oh, well, you're assuming that these other planets that last for trillions of years, that life is possible there. And they say, well, let's look at some differences between them and our planet. And there are some differences. So our star is unusually large. That's why it has an unusually short lifetime. These other, most of these stars out there are smaller than ours. They, la they will live a lot longer than ours. And that's why they'll last for trillions of years. And small stars have some differences from big stars. I mean, obviously one of them is just <laughs> big stars have more light. Yeah. But, you know, but that's not so much of an issue because you can just have a planet closer to a smaller star and it's basically in the same sort of habitable zone. We are farther away from our big star. So that's not an issue. But other issues are small stars, the planets around them, they tend to have bigger flares at the stars, which kind of fry the planets every once in a while and maybe knock off the atmosphere from the planets. They have, con they don't have as much continental drift or continental drift mm -hmm. doesn't last as long on them. And they can get tidal locking where one side faces the star and the other side faces away. And so one side gets really hot, the other gets really cold. And people have said, that's why we're on this, you know, star that's really big, even if it's unusual, is because small stars, they just can't support life. So all these arguments against small stars, they apply basically to planets like ours with just a small, thin ocean and lots of land. If you have a huge ocean that's deep, well, flares aren't a problem. Continental drift isn't a problem, and neither is tidal locking. None of those are problems if you're just a huge ocean planet. So then life could on the fall could have arisen on one of these large ocean planets around one of these small stars. And then the last argument people have is, oh, well, if it's a big star with an ocean, how are they going to get off? <laughs> like part of the reason we can get off our planet relatively easy is it's not so big, so the gravity is not so strong, and mm. we make fire 
on land, which is hard to make fire in the ocean. And, uh, you know, you can launch off of land easier than you can launch out of the ocean. So that's why, you know, they want to write off the ocean planets and say, no, advanced lives couldn't appear in the oceans. But I got to notice, look, the time duration before between which we had pretty advanced technology here and got off the planet is a really short time compared oh, yeah. to cosmological times. It's a tiny time. So look, mm -hmm. maybe on ocean worlds, it takes them a lot longer. But, you know, if it's a factor of 100 longer than us, that means instead of, you know, a thousand years, it takes them a hundred thousand years. That's still a tiny period mm -hmm. of time. Okay. So I think any, any advanced life that could become really intelligent and advanced and technological under an ocean, they would have plenty of time to figure out how to get off. That's, I bet they'd be really advanced too, because you had to overcome all those obstacles. So their stuff would be super, super advanced. So anyway, I, I think that ocean yeah. worlds are perfectly reasonable candidates. And so I got to think we happen to be on this bigger star and that's just a coincidence. You know, it's, it's not, it's not that all life has to appear around big stars. Life could also appear on small stars and life doesn't have to appear on land. It could appear in the oceans and even advanced life like us doesn't have to appear on land. Uh, those would be my guesses about, but there's a lot we don't know. No, yeah, most of it anyway. I, think, I just, I think an ocean world would be pretty cool. You show up and there's nothing there. All of a sudden this like ships come out to greet you or attack you well well in some sense it's like the atmosphere you could show up at the top of the earth's atmosphere and just not bother to look under the atmosphere and see what's mm -hmm. down on the ground because you think you know who cares about what's under gas but you know that's how you would look at an ocean world you say well, look at everything's down on the water you kind of going down the waters if you want to see stuff then you just go down there and see what you can find oh yeah i didn't think about that like that because the earth is kind of like a the atmosphere would be like a gas giant right when think anything about it and it burns when you go through it. Right? <laughs> you got to be careful going through this atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. in well, I can try to uh, we'll wrap it up here pretty soon. I was wanting to ask you, like, you know, the have you ever heard of the gateway process from the CIA? Gateway process. It's let me I pulled it up. It's I don't it doesn't sound analysis and assessment of gateway process. Basically, the CIA released some documents in 03 that were about the universe is a hologram um, and thoughts could become a particle. And it's, it's yeah. really, it's, it's really wild. Yeah. It doesn't sound like something the CIA is actually using. Right. So this sounds like maybe this is a honeypot maybe to attract other people to get tempted by whatever it is. Yeah. I was, I, but I was going to, I was going to follow it up just kind of, cause I was, um, I read it a few weeks ago. I was like, it's kind of crazy, but your elephant in the brain is kind of like a parallel think parallel with the, you know, you described it as being the press secretary of your behavior, not the president. Right. Like so I, I have this other book called The Elephant in the Brain about how you're wrong about your motives a lot. And uh, that's pretty disturbing because um, you tend to think that you know what you're doing and why. Mm -hmm. And uh, to realize that you don't know why you're doing what you're doing is just pretty scary. Uh, <laughs> it and really is. That's the point here that you are, in fact, wrong about what you're doing, what you're doing now. What you're doing is actually makes sense. So the idea is evolution made you to do some things and they all make sense, but it also made you to not know what you're doing and to deny it. To, that is, the president's press secretary doesn't know what the president's really doing and that helps them spin a good story about it. The president's actually doing something that's sensible, at least from their point of view, but it's often mm -hmm. in the interest of the president and the press secretary not to tell the press secretary why they're really doing things because then they can make up a better reason. So that's your subconscious is mm -hmm. making good choices, at least sensible choices for you, but it's not letting you know the real reasons and allowing you to be wrong about the real reasons. And that's, that's something like having, it's a conspiracy theory of your mind, really. So if you really you know, is, that, that's basically what I was asking about that, that document, but I was going to say on the same vein, how you feel about the manifestation process that some people preach that you can think about something hard enough for your subconscious and it eventually comes to fruition. Just, I, I don't start, mean to get too woo-woo. I just, just wanted to ask. Well, I started out relatively religious. My parents were very religious. Mm -hmm. They were pastor and missionaries, and my siblings have been religious. And then in college, I learned physics. And physics seemed to me a pretty thorough view of the world that just made a lot of sense of everything. It makes sense of chemistry and biology and you know, geology and lots of engineering. Physics is this, even computer science at all. It all makes sense. And so I became less, more basically, 
not religious because mm -hmm. there wasn't a place in this physics worldview for other sorts of weird stuff people wanted to believe in. And that's still roughly where I am. I'm basically believe in physics. So I'm, I mean, we could be wrong about physics, of course, but there's a lot of things we do know about physics and I'm pretty reluctant to go very far away from the physics we know to postulate weird stuff. Oh yeah. But you know, the UFO stuff I talked to you about today is completely consistent with ordinary physics. There's mm -hmm. nothing, there's nothing about physics that's it's at the all best part about it. Honestly, contradiction with what I was just describing. The age of M is completely consistent with physics. Mm -hmm. And so is all the thing as we'll tell you about grabby aliens and about, um, even UFOs, if UFOs are aliens. Um, so if you start to talk to me about woo stuff where I go, well, could that be consistent with physics? And as soon as I start to suspect, no, that doesn't look very consistent with physics. I'm just going to go, well, you're going to have to offer me a lot stronger evidence to convince me of that because I am pretty convinced <laughs> of physics. Well, I believe you. I mean, I, I don't doubt it a bit. I mean, the uh, it kind of goes along, almost runs into the simulation theory as well when you start to get into that kind of thing. Right. So the simulation theory basically tells you that, sure, everything looks like it's consistent with physics. That's because mm -hmm. everybody's setting it up just to make it look that way. But really underlying, it's a completely different thing. So that's a conspiracy theory of the reality. You know, mm -hmm. simulation theory says the reality around you is a conspiracy to make you think that it's the physics it looks like. But in fact, it's not really that thing. It's and like a seven hours more longer conversation that we don't have. Right. So that, that's... that's I mean, I have, I've done some work on that in the past, but I think on that, it's just not true, but it's possibly true. That is, mm -hmm. I don't think you should decide it's surely not true. I think you should give it a modest probability, but basically probably not true. <laughs> yes. That's a good, that's the best way I've ever heard it described. So I let my mind wonder. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a fun, fun thing to do is go think about that stuff. But I still, that's why I have people like you right. on well, telling me earlier. Look, the only way to figure out whether something is probably not true is to ask yourself, well, what if it were true and, and work your way through that? So you definitely need this ability mm -hmm. to entertain unusual assumptions in order to analyze them to mm -hmm. decide if they're true. So I definitely 100%. have thought through the simulation hypothesis to try to figure out, okay, what would it imply and what observations you know, do we have that would be in conflict with it or consistent with it? That's the only way you can actually figure out, well, is it true? The that same, makes sense. same for UFOs, right? If you say, are those UFOs aliens? How am I supposed to know unless I say, okay, let's assume they were aliens. Let's try to think through how that would work. And then at the end of the day, you say, okay, here's the best story I came up with how UFOs could be aliens. And now I got to say, let's compare that to our best other theories and try to do a judgment. What, what's the best one we got? But there's no way you can really compare theories unless for each one you're willing to embed, basically to inhabit it, to basically try mm -hmm. to see the world from the point of view of that theory for a while and ask yourself, okay, what does it say? What does it predict? So where, where do you stand on the, the parallel universe theory? Is that anywhere in physics? Well, there's, uh, well, so there's definitely people who think the universe has more dimensions than we think it does. Yeah. And then in that sense, in those higher dimensions, what we see is just kind of a plane. And then the question is, are there planes that are sitting near it nearby where there's a mm. few rare connections between them? That's what a parallel universe would be. It would be another plane near our plane, mm. but somehow connected to it. And, you know, there are physicists who try to work that through and they've tried to come up with observations that might be consistent with it. But as far as I can see, there's no particular reason to believe it. It's just a possibility mm. that we should be watching out for. 100% I agree that the, the wildest little I say wild but the experiment I've seen is how when they do the particle that doesn't respond until you acknowledge it like it's I haven't I haven't heard of a particle like that it's it's a, a photon I, I don't know why well, I said no, that, that can't be right <laughs> photons are just what you and I are sending back and forth right now through these screens. I had to look that up I, I didn't know we were going down this rabbit hole tonight I, I would have looked it up but it's like right. it just goes haphazardly but then if you acknowledge it it does one other thing but well there's quantum mechanics wherein mm -hmm. you know when we observe things that affects the behavior and you know I've spent years of course learning quantum mechanics as a physicist so mm -hmm. I, I you know Relativity and quantum mechanics and a number of other areas of physics really are quite different than your ordinary intuitions about the physical world around you. 
But once you spend years learning them, then they become your new intuitions and then they're no longer so strange. But quantum mechanics is still pretty strange in many ways, even when you understand it really well. I was looking it up. Yeah, it's a particle. Okay. I wasn't crazy. <laughs> you know, I, wasn't, I, knew I'd, I knew I'd read it somewhere. But anyway, I'll, I'll go ahead and wrap it up. I've, ha I've had a lot of fun talking tonight. I needed this conversation. I've been on vacation. Kind of brought me back into the realm. All right. It, well, I, I, welcome back to uh, to strangeness. Yeah. <laughs> to the world of yeah. strangeness here. Oh, I freaking love it. The uh, the uh, writing, getting everything together and the material I needed. I need to get back in. It's been about two weeks since I've right. done anything. The, but it's a hard trade-off to make. I mean, some people look at strangeness and go, no, you guys are just into strangeness and that's why you think this weird stuff. And so I'm going to be safe and believe ordinary things. And then you mm -hmm. other people think you're so into ordinary things, you'll just believe everything's ordinary, even if we're strange. So each side can accuse the other side of being biased toward wanting to see oh, the yeah. world one way or the other. And that means if you're trying to judge between them, there's really no escaping, like walking through the details and going, okay, you could be right. You could be right. I don't know who yet. Let's, let's walk through step by step ask for mm -hmm. each particular piece of evidence and then weigh it up at the end and say, okay, you know, which side fits the evidence better. <laughs> There's just no escaping that. You can't just go on vibes from the beginning of like, well, I'm this sort of person. I like this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. that's just, you know, that's just not going to work. Got it. And, and it'll like, it'll make your head hurt when you think about it too, if you try to be one way or the other. It's all going to make your head hurt. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, right. The world is just strange. You know, we're, that's one thing we're pretty sure of by now. The world is, in fact, just strange. I'm just, I'm just waiting on some kind of something, some kind of the next scientific advancements that shows us maybe in, into like, like a dimension, like we were talking about, or some kind of, some kind of wild paradigm shift that we've well, had. I mean, like I told you, like an elephant in the brain. There's just wild things to realize about your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I've lately been thinking about culture and it turns out there's wild things to realize about your culture and where it comes from and what it tells you. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, you, you're pretty gullible about your culture. It tells you all sorts of things and you just believe it. And yeah, if you start to doubt, you'll, <laughs> you'll find your head hurts realizing, oh, I've been just assuming all these things that my culture tells me are true. That's the usual thing to assume. But what if it wasn't true? Kind of makes you feel like a bad person a little bit. Yes, indeed. Your like, culture man, tells you you are a bad person if you question it. That's one of the things your culture tells you. And one of the things you should wonder. Okay. Just because my culture tells me I'm a bad person if I doubt my culture, does that mean I shouldn't doubt my culture? I mean, yes, yeah, so I'm a bad person. It's kind of kind of what religion does too. I'm Catholic and it's kind of does right. that. Right. But and you know, just but just because they're playing these games doesn't mean they're wrong exactly, but it does mean you gotta you gotta question them. You gotta walk mm -hmm. through and and you know I think I think we're supposed to question them as a human. That's what your culture tells you too. So you yeah. Oh, God. You can't trust that one either. What is happening? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't real, is it? It's going to come breaking down any second. The simulation is going to end. They're going to unlock the capsule. Yeah, that I listened to, the, to that TED talk as well as several other ones. And that was the one I was like, man, I'm second guessing everything at this point. Right. Well, of course, that's sometimes something people do just to disorient people and make it easy to fool them with simple things. So mm -hmm. you have to also be wary about being too easily disoriented. You know, there's, I'm a, I'm a simpleton. There's, there's a, I guess in the, um, meaning of life mooning, but movie by, um, Monty Python, there's this <laughs> scene I like where, um, this people come to somebody's, um, door and says, you know, basically, can we have your kidney? And she goes, well, no. And then he goes, let me explain two things. And he tells you the story of the universe and all these grand, huge things and how you're this tiny person and vast history. And she's just, oh, I go, wow, look at all this stuff. And then, okay, she's at the end. And they say, okay, so can we have your kidney? She says, oh, I guess so. <laughs> Ended it on Monty <laughs> Python. Yeah, so, you know, be wary of somebody who's just trying to, you know, grab your wallet by spinning grand stories yeah. of all the wonderful things outside your view so that you that's decide like, you're not going to pay attention to the the person grabbing your wallet that's like the unethical life hack is that if, if you need somebody to help you with something you ask for something really really complicated Big, first and right? then and you, you compromise <laughs> you settle for what you actually wanted exactly I've done that at work before. i've done that at work before yeah I'm gonna lie. other <laughs> people have probably done it to you <laughs> yeah i'm sure they have that's probably why i'm that's how I'll probably ended up where I at at right now. Hey, just real quick, you know, hit you with that one. But anyway, do you have any projects coming up besides your uh, current uh, 
your books? Well, Anything I've you been want to working hold? on Cultural Drift the last few months, and uh, we have really dramatic uh, consequences of cultural evolution that people haven't realized. So, you know, if you want to talk again, I could tell you about that, but uh, <laughs> we don't really yeah. have enough time to go into that here, I guess. But Oh, uh, no, yeah. I would, I've would. i kept you 30 minutes longer, and I promise now, but I'd, I didn't want to stop you because I was just no. I was just sucking it but, in. Happy to, but again, you know, I'm I'm the sort of person who has an obsession at any one time, and uh, that's my obsession the last four months: cultural drift. I think we have a lot in common when it comes to that obsession. Just something we can study ad nauseum. Well, that's the out. only way you know extended things ever get done. You know, if you if you got bored with everything in an hour, nothing more than an hour size project would mm -hmm. ever get done. The only way you can ever do week or year long projects is if you have an obsession that you get into it and you keep going for that long. My, mine is this media empire, this podcast. And I've, I, I've called it like, I'm trying to like Oppenheimer, the podcast, yeah. like make it just as hard as I could to make it go forward. And just kind of, once it just bleeds off all the energy it can, like I can move to the next podcast. There you go. Well, <laughs> all right. Well, good luck with this podcast. And uh, oh yeah, we'll talk again. Uh, when your book comes out, let me know. If your next well, book, next project, uh, it'll be a while, but uh, I'm definitely, you know, can talk about things before then, but you know, cool, we'll cool. see how this episode goes. Oh yeah. I think it's going to be just fine. I'll, I'll send it to you so you can share it out and review right. it when I get done editing it down. I'll, I'll take out the okay. parts for the packet loss and everything. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's okay. It's, it All seemed right. to have settled down. All right. Well then good night, Bobby. All right. See you. I'll hit my theme music and you take it easy. Thanks for coming on, man. I never didn't believe in being quit. I never believed in, I didn't believe in, I never gave it any thought. They kept wood knocking back and forth to each other, and it was in a pattern. Barn owls don't typically throw rocks. They come across these tracks. Sasquatch is still not on my mind.